Ah, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Luca De Paulis, uh, and this is the uh, Strong 2020 Public Lecture Series. We are uh, at the 13th uh, lecture in the framework of, of this uh, Strong 2020 Public Lecture Series. I am postdoc at the at National Laboratory of Frascati of INFN in Frascati and uh, website manager of 2020 uh, website. And, uh, uh, member of the Dissemination and Communication Board. Uh, the Strong 2020 project um, is focused on the strong interaction at the frontier of knowledge and it is uh, uh, an European project uh, and the consortium includes uh, 46 participant institutions embracing 14 uh, European member states, one international European interest organization of Geneva and one European candidate countries. And the project involves research in 36 countries in 32 work packages, transnational access activities, virtual access activities, networking activities, joint research activities, and other uh, packages. The Stone 2020 collaboration offers open access to six world-class experimental facilities. COSI, MAMI, LNF, ELSA, GSI, FAIR, and CERN. Additionally, the European Center for Theoretical Physics, ACT Star in Trento, is playing a crucial role in forestering innovative theoretical developments on hadron physics in close synergy with experimentalists. All information about the members of these collaborations uh, the, the project and uh, all uh, experimental update can, can be found on the website of Strong 2020, uh, www.strong2020.eu. Let's go now to the lecture of today, Machine Learning, the History of the Universe with uh, Maria Paola Lombardo. Uh, this uh, lecture in which we will uh, learn something about the application of machine learning in uh, physics, in particular related to the universe. And the lecture is uh, uh, presented by the Maria Paola Lombardo, uh, who is senior researcher at INFN in Italy. Maria Paola Lombardo is a high energy theorist whose research focuses on strong interaction phase transition and computational physics. She graduated from Pisa University and specialized with the a APE group in Rome. And she has uh, had uh, uh, a large number of positions in uh, to INFN uh, at the University of Illinois, at uh, Urban Champaign, and at Desi Jewelry. And she has been uh, a visiting professor at the University of Bifield and at the Humboldt University Zoo in Berlin, and many other activities related to, his, uh, to her career of uh, researcher. So now I give the floor to Maria Paola Lombardo, uh, who will uh, uh, talk about machine learning, the history of the universe. OK, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Luca, for this very nice introduction. Uh, thank you to, to you and, and Catalina for having me as a part of this, this very interesting series of public lecture. And thanks to everyone who did uh, connect uh, today. So as, as Luca has uh, said, I want to tell you a bit about what machine learning, artificial intelligence methods, and machine learning in particular uh, can do for, for us uh, physicists interested to the, in the physics of strong interactions. And I will pick up uh, a couple of examples that I will, I will detail in the following. So the goal of the talk is just to give you a flavor. It's, of course, it's a very large subject. It would be impossible to cover it on its detail, but I hope that the bring home message would be be just a feeling on how these uh, new techniques can be applied uh, to science. And in particular, I will choose uh, machine learning. The title has machine learning. Machine learning is uh, just a subset of artificial intelligence. It's just that part of artificial intelligence which is more directly related and connected uh, with, with um, scientific applications, scientific analysis, 
and in particular with computations, as I will detail a little bit more in the following. And as an example of applications, I, I have chosen aspects related to phase transitions in the early universe and to the current um, state of matters, in particular, the particular state of matter that we find inside uh, neutron stars. But this will be detailed, as I say, a little bit during, during the lecture. So basically, I will go through these uh, four points. And uh, let me just start. So history of the universe. Well, when we speak about history, history, we speak about time. And so the history of the universe, at the best that we know, started uh, about uh, 15 billion milliard in uh, internet years uh, ago with something that in a folkloristic way we call Big Bang, but we don't know exactly what happened at the beginning. But we know that whatever happened, happened really this, this very, very long ago. And then time went by. How can we describe this? How can we connect to experience? How do we describe this in quantitative terms? Well, something which is very, very useful, and it has emerged, and there is consensus about that in all studies, is that time and temperature are very, very closely connected. So namely, as time goes by and time passes, temperature goes down, cools, so the universe cools. So it started to be incredibly hot, so beyond imagination. And then it was a story of cooling down slowly till nowadays. And uh, where is this? Um, so if I want to get a feeling of what happens when I walk back in time, uh, just to, to build some intuition, uh, I will just can just imagine what happens in a very, very hot world. So how would our universe change if we have a gigantic thermostat or something and we can switch on the, the heat and make it hotter, 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 even more? So example we have, for instance, in the activity of volcanoes. And so we know that lava is one of the hottest um, material that we can create on, on Earth. Um, but then uh, we know it's, it's very, very hot. And then finally, it cools down and forms again ordinary matter. So hot matter is, is very chaotic, is fluid, is indistinguishable. So everything is mixed up. And then finally, it cools down and takes again the, the usual forms of uh, earth, soil, usual shapes. And so if I want to make this uh, connection, I mean, I'm I realize I'm asking you lots of effort of fantasy, but let's imagine if we want to make a similar connection with the history of the universe. So these is, uh, are two arrows that I have already shown you of time and, and temperature. So time points towards today and temperature would be increasing, uh, is increasing towards Big Bang. And so there is this process of starting in a very chaotic system at the time of Big Bang everything was mixed up and I don't know how many of you have a physics background and how many of you are just curious but maybe also the curious have heard that we have uh, as of today we recognize uh, different fundamental forces in nature but very very at the very very beginning everything was confused because it was very hot and everything was just chaotic and indistinguished and the universe cools down there are these sharp changes. You know what characterizes these changes when we talk about the phase transition. We are really thinking of a situation in which the matter changes in a qualitative way. So we know that we can cool down water, we can have hot water, a little bit cool water, nice fresh water to drink. But then when we cool it down more and more, it becomes ice and then it's really dramatic change is a phase transition from water and ice and here it happens the same so it cools down a little bit and then at some point um, that was uh, still very close to big bang 10 to the minus 11 second approximately after big bang there is the first important uh, transition the very first important change when the higgs particle that has been uh, discovered at cern was born, it became the Higgs particle as we know today. 
after a while, not so much, we have this, the transition that we are very much interested in, in our network. It is called the quantum chromodynamics transition. And this is a transition. The dramatic change here is that after this transition, we start having all hadrons as we know today, like protons, neutrons, all these particles that make our ordinary matter. But then you may want to ask me, but how, how, do, how do you know that there were phase transitions? So maybe everything was already there since the very beginning. And then at some point, it just uh, freeze a little bit and became what is, it is now. Well, that's exactly the kind of studies that one does uh, numerically, theoretically. So there are mathematical tools, which I will try to describe for us uh, during the talk, which allows us to, to say with a good level of confidence that indeed there was a phase transition. So indeed, there was this very dramatic change which bring, which eventually led to the matter as we know today. And in particular, this transition, which is the latest cosmological transition, after then, the universe was still cooling down, cooling down, cooling down. Uh, different atomic species, different nuclei were formed at different stages during this final cooling down, but there were no further phase transition, no further dramatic changes. This is the latest cosmological transition, the most recent phase transition. It can even be reproduced in laboratory at the LAC at CERN. And this transition is very much one of the focus of the Strong 2020 network. So this is why I have chosen it as uh, to illustrate these artificial intelligence methods that I would like to discuss. But then another point I like to say is uh, in the way of introduction is that when matter cools down, by no means uh, it cools down in just one form. It may cool down in many different forms. Uh, for instance, these are pictures of, of lavas from, I think these are taken from Hawaiian volcanoes. And it could, for instance, these are the two most uh, common forms. They're called Pahoehoe and Ara lava. And you see the Pahoehoe is, is very nice. It's this nice ripple and the nice shapes, while the Ara lava is just chaotic and uh, it, it's hard to walk in. You cannot walk in barefoot even when it, it cools down. And what makes this difference? So it's not just a matter of temperature because when it was temperature, everything cools down and everything is the same. But here is uh, another quantity, which is, which is density. And we can use this, for instance, by, by considering a different form of ice. So I have made the example of lava as the example of something that cools down in different forms, but ice is the same. And I don't know if you have read the very nice book a few years ago, it was called uh, Smila's Sense of Snow. And she was saying as in Greenland, there are very many different names to indicate the different type of snows and different type of ice crystals. And this different, what discriminates between different type of ice crystals, even if they all are after a phase transition from liquid water, but what makes a difference is temperature, yes, but also density. So when you change, not only when you change temperature, but also when you change density, you control the different form of matters that you can create. And there is another nice example, mostly at room temperature, that maybe everyone makes jokes about, and you know there is this very nice transition between graphite, the material which makes our pencils, and diamonds. And when you subject graphite to high pressures, then you can make transition, you can make diamonds out of, of, our, of your pencil. Actually, this process is actually done in laboratory for research purposes, but it is indeed so expensive, the equipment that is much easier to buy real diamonds, okay, natural diamonds. But anyway, the point is that besides temperature, what controls different uh, phases is also density. And now back to the phase diagram of strong interactions that I want to discuss. So I added the, <coughs> the density axis to temperature. So before I was showing you as a function of temperature, now it is reversed, so now temperature is up in the diagram. So here is the early universe and we are sitting here. And so this is the transition I was telling you about. And here is density. And I see that if I increase density, 
uh, matter appears again in different form. That's similar things as different form of lava or similar things as different forms of ice. And we have the high density inside nuclei. They're quite dense. Iron is very dense, for instance, matter. But then there is neutron stars. Neutron stars are relatively small stars, very dense stars, and they are made by neutrons very, very closely packed. And we still don't know how these neutrons can really get together and which kind of matter they arrange themselves in. And that's something that we really want to understand. This is some big curiosity to understand how these uh, small cold, relatively cold stars, they, they, do, they, they do work. So to make connection, again, this is the plot I was showing you before I was uh, mentioning this phase transition. Again, this phase transition would be this one at zero density. And in this phase diagram, I have already added, also added density for the reasons I mentioned that it controls phases. And the topics of interest for the talk that I want to tell you how artificial intelligence helps understanding these topics are more or less highlighted here. So this, this transition and properties of neutron stars. Now, to avoid generating confusion, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence come at the end of a long story. So we investigate these topics in many other ways that I can tell you if you wish, or I can talk to you later if you wish, whatever. So there are very many studies on this, a very, very long story. But these are newer applications, and I think they have potentials. We can, maybe, maybe they can bring us really something new. And also they are very interesting playground also to make these methods better. So there is really a dialogue between physicists and engineers and computer scientists working on, on these methods. So these are physics-wise the topics I, I want to study. Now I pause physics for, for a moment and um, I want then to tell you about uh, what, I'm telling, what I'm talking about when I talk on machine learning and which kind of things that I have in mind. Well, <clears throat> artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is, is a scientific aspect of somehow the scientific subset, the more scientific subset of artificial intelligence, is really everywhere. Nowadays, basically, you have seen for sure many things. Your digital assistant, when you talk to Siri, voice recognition, in order to recognize the spam messages, you recognize by these artificial intelligence techniques. When you get suggestions, when you search, you try to reserve a hotel somewhere, and then you start receiving one zillion suggestions for restaurants, museums, whatnot. That's again machine learning. Again, targeting advertising to, to people, detecting fraud in credit cards usage, and whatnot is really everywhere. An example on how it works and why it is different from ordinary computer simulations. So I told you that in the phase diagram of QCD, the two topics I want to discuss you in the light, in light of machine learning have been studied quite a bit also by normal computer simulation. Now I want to pick an, an example, which is I think very illustrative in which we can compare how machine learning and ordinary computer simulations work. So what's more or less the difference between the two. And so is the just understanding collective behavior of the murmuration of starlings. And you can observe, I think, in many skies, uh, especially sunset, these uh, wonderful animals uh, creating these uh, fantastic shapes in sky. And then, of course, is a question that we ask how these uh, shapes emerge. is still, again, a generating structure. Why lava becomes with different forms? So how this starling behaves like that? Well, the first studies on this uh, have been done by computer simulation. They have been so relevant that even um, were even studied in, in the group of uh, Giorgio Parisi and other scientists that they were trying to understand uh, complex system. They are one aspect of complex system by computer simulation. And so the idea is that you make simulations with some modeling, and then you compare the results uh, of the simulations with what you observe and conclude whether the simulations were realistic or, or, or not. Um, well, it's a very strange combination because exactly at this time, there is a seminar 
going on in La Sapienza in Rome, when one of the main authors of this study, René Giardini, is exactly discussing this paper. So it, it just happened, but it's just to say that maybe it's not by chance. So this is really very, very interesting. And what they discovered is that the, the source of ordering is really topological. So what does it mean topological? Uh, we've got topology, everything which has to do, which is resilient against small deformation. So for instance, if I, if I consider a Möbius strip, it will always remain a Möbius strip you know, with this kind of connection, even if I deform it a little bit. If I make a closed simple strip, it will remain a closed simple strip, even if I deform it a little bit. So the fact that uh, the, the tri what triggered the murmuration is topological uh, rather than other things, it tells us that what really matters are the each bird is really connecting or targeting a small subset of other birds and it just follow them even if they fly a little bit farther away and this is uh, interesting very interesting behavior that the ethologists will comment more I, no expert of course i just listen to what ethologists are telling us um, then it has been really established by computer simulations so basically how do you do the your computer modeling how does it work well the first simulations of uh, modeling collective behavior in birds uh, evolution um it was really quite old already in 86 and it uses something that is called boys not birds that would be the way american east american the east coast in new york city you know when they want to be a little bit American, really, New York City guys, they say birds and such, say birds, I don't know. And this is boys would be that. And these are birdoid objects. And basically, in a nutshell, without entering into the detail of the code, you write a code, the humans tell computers what to do, computers do what humans tell to do, and humans check what computers have done and say, okay, that's okay, that's similar or is not similar. So, but then the humans have a full control of what computers are doing in this sense. So, but in machine learning, that's exactly the opposite or different. So the idea is that computers should act without telling them exactly how to act. So they learn somehow by analogy or association, much like a human would do. And there are many different ways of doing this. And of course you do this through algorithms. So there is no magic, you still have procedures that you implement. But the final effect is that the computer trains itself. Uh, he learns more and more examples and then he learns. But you have tried this maybe on chat GPT. This is not machine learning, it's really more logic stuff. But maybe you ask a question and you get some not so correct answer. Uh, for instance, if I ask my name, ChatGPT, they say, you won uh, the Nobel Prize. So no, it's not correct. <laughs> say, and next time, the, the algorithm will know and will correct itself. So it learns by analogy and by training, like, uh, like human. And indeed, since there are very many different ways, there is a very complicated taxonomy of machine learning in which people try to classify all the different ways in which this is uh, accomplished. But I just want to say that two main things, uh, aside from details, basically there are two very, two different mainstreams for machine learning. One is called supervised learning. So you teach step by step, we tell more example, and one is unsupervised learning. Then there is a more fine uh, distinction, but these two are really the, the two main things. So this is, for instance, another nice presentation I stole from this wonderful talk by Wendy Carande at the UCLA, I think. And again, she does lots of uh, examples, but again, the main division is between supervised and unsupervised learning. And what are these two categories? How, how can we um, simply classify this? Well, in a supervised learning, sorry, in supervised learning, you are assigned things to categories. So you already know that you have your categories like uh, cats, dogs, uh, sheep, whatever. And then you recognize, you put things in order. 
Unsupervised is more interesting because you really discover categories. You throw there um, a bunch of animals and then you ask the algorithm, look, are these animals all belonging to the same species or are they different? Are they different in any significant way? And this is what I find nice Wikipedia, how Wikipedia yeah, presents this, so I'm just using what I found on Wikipedia uh, to explain the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. And if you want to understand if an animal is a penguin, elephant or kangaroo, if you are learning is supervised, you really start with these categories. So you tell the algorithm, look, there are penguins, there are elephants, there are kangaroos. But if you want to make uh, unsupervised, you start in a very generic way, and then you ask the algorithm to, to learn, to, to tell you, look, you know, I have this group of animals, and I have identified three different sets that I don't know what they, what they are they, because I don't, but I can tell you there is a set A, set B, and set C. And if the unsupervised learning works well, it will turn out that sets are elephant and sets B are kangaroo and sets C are penguins. So these are these two main different um, paradigms. It has been a long story before learning to that. I will not uh, try to cover it, but uh, I would say normally the, um, the birth of artificial intelligence uh, is placed uh, with the first neural network modeling in 43, and then machine learning really emerged as a tool in the 50s with the first program to play chess they were extremely popular till the 90s and I still remember being quite old when in 96 Deep Blue uh, beat Kasparov it was uh, it really made the, the headline so chess were very popular at that time and having a machine uh, beating a world champion was great uh, sensation and then, of course, the contemporary development are those that uh, <clears throat> we see nowadays on Google. Uh, they built on deep learning. That's the difference between standard machine learning and deep learning. So machine learning has some neural network that by some minimization finds the most likely analogy for uh, images or animals. And when you have a deep learning, you have many, many layers of networks. And so you can go deep and deep and deep in doing the classification. And this emerged in the, at the beginning of this millennium and really opened the way of the contemporary development and the, the real impressive progress that we are witnessing uh, nowadays. Now, um, why that triggers, what triggers machine learning and artificial intelligence? Well, it, it was uh, science has its own uh, development, not always, you can't always explain or control, but for sure there is a very clear entanglement between machine learning and computers. And, and as, as in the example I have given to you already, very natural to compare the capabilities that you have with standard computers or the capabilities that you can develop with, with machine learning. So very quickly, uh, computers, well, I don't know if you remember this line, it's from a movie, relatively recent movie, I, I found so impressive, and also in the book, get the girl to check the numbers. And this is according, this was John Glenn, but what's significant is 62. And before uh, accepting to go on the first orbital space flight, so that was the first time. Uh, so, of course, the, the launch had to be computed by a computer. You have to decide the launch parameters, so the angle, the speed, the whatnot, etc. And this was done by the first IBM installed at the NASA Goddard Flight Center. But John Glenn said, look, I will only go, go if this girl, that she was a mathematician, very good mathematician, whether only if she will check what the computer has done. So this is the, the story. And this, uh, this Catherine Johnson, the mathematician, she repeated by hand what the computer had done. The, way, the reason why I'm telling this is that uh, basically half a century ago, slightly more than half a century ago, computers and humans were really 
going head to head, what the computer could do, a human could do, maybe a little bit, took a little bit of time, a little bit longer, but still the human would do. And now clearly that's uh, completely different uh, now. So this is okay, these are from the movie, we got the, the, the thing. And, uh, <clears throat> but now we are, just to give you a feeling of what computers can do now and what we achieve with computers, we are at the verge of exascale era and we run with 10 to the 18, meaning 10 to the 18 operations every second. Think about that. So this really goes beyond, beyond any human capability. And since in this way we can create realities which are even virtual and fantastic, there are even speculations by philosophers that we live in a computer simulation. But forgetting about that, certainly machine learning has been fooled by the fast growing of computer. And in particular, because these very, very fast computers, they do generate a big set of data. And so the machine learning has been developed also for classify, identify and interpret this big set of data. But once the capability is there, then it can be used also to interpret big data, which comes not from simulations, but from experiments and from analysis. And one very important example that I will get back at the end is the analysis of data from gravitational wave. So the um, gravitational waves experiments, they collect incredible large amount of data, incredible, incredible. They really have the, the problem on how to transfer this data from one accelerator to another, from one, this, from one detector, to an, from one gravitational wave antenna to another, or to an antenna laboratory to computer center is incredible amount of data. And you have to dig deep into this data to understand what was happening. And one of the things that we want to know there is whether any neutron star has been playing an important role. And this is why we are interested also in our network in this capability of machine learning, because when they analyze big data, they can also analyze this big data produced by gravitational wave, analyze received by gravitational wave antennas, and they have the capability to search inside um, this enormous amount of data imprinting of gravitational waves produced by neutron stars, which are very dear objects uh, to us. Um, then let me say some more words about the specifics of machine learning then in, in our field. In a very minimalistic form, and maybe I managed to convey before the, the feeling that machine learning, uh, sorry, that a phase transition may be triggered by, by temperature, and many different, many different systems from particle physics, quarks and gluons, the objects that we are interested in, and lava and whatnot, uh, there is a similarity of patterns that you start from more ordered frozen system at low temperature, and then finally when temperature grows large, the system becomes disordered, chaotic, liquid, etc. That's very generic, and since it's very generic, one can use models, so generic models that can help you uh, understanding simple features. So this is one of the two formula that I put, but you can also ignore it. But there is a simple model that we use to describe a phase transition, which is called easy model. Easy is the person who has uh, first uh, written, wrote, this model down and analyzed. And it is basic, a collection is a two-dimensional model, is a collection of spins, and they interact with each other in very simple terms. You can add the magnetic field, external magnetic field. So spins are small, small magnets and like a small compass on each side, but this compass can only be north or south, so it can't be anything else. And then we ask the question, uh, what happens? What do these spins like to do uh, as a function of temperature when I have an external field? Well, as you know, then you have all this compass and you put a magnetic field. It's like compass 
it's like a set of compass in the Earth's magnetic field. So they will go all in the same direction. They will be aligned in the same direction. But when temperature sets in, they will start becoming very disordered because the effect of temperature, they want to disorder, wants to disorder the spins. And eventually this temperature will overcome the effect of the magnetic field and all the system will become disordered. So these are just uh, snapshots that you can do with the, with the simulation. And you can even calculate this analytically. And so you have really analytic control and you can confirm that this happens in two dimensions. If you want to make in a more complicated way, this is a more complicated example in which by computer simulation, you compute the magnetization. So the sum of all the magnetic, the orientation of all the spins as a function of temperature. And then you see very clearly that there are two regimes when L is the size of your box where you put the, the spins and then you see that when the box become large you have clearly two different regimes you start observing a real phase transition so remember that we mentioned that the phase transition is a, is a real change it's not something smooth that goes in. no no there is a real phase transition from a situation in which magnetization is one or normalization and then becomes zero so as a function of temperature you have something that definitely change from ordered to disordered, all spins in all direction. So lessons, temperature is really responsible for, not only is responsible for phase transitions, as we know also in, intuitively, but most important, we have mathematical tools which can be refined and make much more complicated, much more sophisticated. But there are mathematical tools to put this generic statement, temperature is responsible for phase transition. Okay, but you can put this statement in, in formula in a quantitative way, and we can exploit this formula. And we can say, oh yes, the phase transition is indeed there when this is temperature 2.3, whatever that, that means. And this, this uh, simple observation is really the key to the quantitative studies of the phase transitions in the early universe, when we are not really there to see what happened, but we can simulate once we have a mathematical model for the theory which undergoes the transition, we can then change the temperature as in the easy model and see what, what happens. So this is uh, uh, what um, this approach with computer simulation has been very, very successful, especially in this this region and it has allowed us to say with some precision, with great precision, which is the temperature at which this latest QCD transition happens, more difficult in this region where we still have learned something. And this has been obtained, our knowledge so far, by computer simulations, these big computers. Now what happens, can we do with machine learning? Then for instance, the model that I have shown you uh, before, where simulations are very successful, by using these machine learning techniques that I'm not going to dwell into the results, but basically it's by analogy. So you ask the, the system, you throw these configurations to the machine learning algorithm and say, algorithm, tell me which configurations is ordered, which is disordered, and the algorithm tells you. He learns, he looks and says, okay, this and this. And by doing this, um, the machine learning algorithm manages indeed to identify two phases. When you ask the system, is this ordered or disordered? Then you say, oh, good. So he can do this exercise exactly as he did for the elephant and the penguin. Very good. But even more fantastic and uh, something that really impresses everyone. I mean, most people who like these things are very much impressed. There are other phase transitions which are a little bit more subtle. So the phase transition that I have shown you for the easy model, that it is very similar to the one of the early universe that I've shown you, but there are they, they have these characteristics of an order parameter. So something that it is clearly zero or non-zero, and I measure that and say, okay, in which I know where I am. But there are phase transitions which are not so clear 
they can be classified mathematically, but they need uh, more work. They are more complicated. And if you just look at these different phases, can you tell that these are different phases? I cannot. I say, well, I can see there are black and white points. Uh, yes, maybe, but on which grounds I can say this is a phase, this is another phase? I don't know. Yet, this, uh, this time unsupervised study is really very nicely telling us that there are these two different phases. It would take longer to explain this, but it really, it really works and it's incredibly impressive. So machine learning algorithm can tell us that there are distinct phases, even if it does not know how these different phases are characterized. And even if by just looking at these configurations, they look exactly identical. I would say this is absolutely impressive. So when we consider two examples without forget all the details, but there are basically two cases in which machine learning so far has been applied to phase transitions in simple model. In the first case, you have intuitive order parameters. So a number which tells you in which phase you are. Uh, mechanization, normalization, zero, non zero, and there are qualitative, clear qualitative differences between the phases. And then we can see that machine learning works as well as other approaches. Good. But the, others, the other case is interesting. There are no intuitive order parameter. Computer simulations would need the theoretical guidance. If I would have to identify two phases in this um, more complicated model, I should know features of the correlation function in conformal field theory. That's non-trivial. Well, machine learning knows nothing about conformal field theory, but still uncovers these two different phases. That's very interesting because maybe there are hidden transitions that we want to learn about and machine learning can find for us. That's great. So now, finally, final uh, 10, 15 minutes, so let me tell you exactly what has been done so far in reality, the, the cases at hand. Um, there is a cartoon, which is nice. I like Calvin and Hobbes very much. And then Calvin is always hypercritical and say, oh, I find Big Bang <laughs> so, such a dull uh, name. How can, how can it be that you can describe, can you describe things which are unimaginable wonder. So it's, a, it's something so incredible. Everything that happened in the early universe, how can you try to reduce in words? Well, that, that's true. But in fact, that's why mathematics and modeling help us. So how do we describe these things that happened far away in the past and we are no longer there, we can't be there to witness them. And I told you it is a phase transition. Yes, it is a phase transition. How can we how do we know that? Well, there is mathematical formulation, of course, of the theory, underlying theory. There is underlying theory, which is called quantum chromodynamics. And within this theory, one can define a quantity, which is not so different, after all, from this little spin of the ISIM model, just more complicated. But indeed, uh, there is a mathematical language that describes these very complicated things and reduce them to something which in the end is not so different from ISIM model. And uh, this is what we analyzed, for instance, with uh, machine learning techniques, uh, etc. And yes, again, we identify the phase transition. I can tell you more if you want to hear, but the idea is that the phase transitions was found. And again, uh, even in more complicated situations, so-called dynamical fairness, yes, it was found. So it works very nice, but in not fully unsupervised, but semi-supervised, uh, so half and half, still identify the phase transition. This is a bit of a technical plot in which I show you some features of the transition which are still unknown. So indeed, we know that this phase transition in hot QCD happens around uh, 120 MeV, that's the unit that it is used for phase transition. Uh, we ask the question how long this phase transition will influence the behavior of the system is still very open question. And we hope that machine learning can help us identifying the limit 
of validity and applications of um, the scaling theory of QCD. So we opened that machine, we hope that machine learning techniques, exactly as they were useful to identify an unknown phase, a difficult to see phase in this gauge is in model, maybe they will help us identifying unknown phases in the strong coupling of work on plasma. And well, let me say maybe a few more words in case some of you have heard or curious or maybe there are experts in the audience. And, and we know that uh, in this, um, in high temperature QCD, this latest cosmological transition, which is related to quantum chromodynamics, is easily described if we consider the symmetries of quantum chromodynamics in the artificial limits in which the quarks have zero mass. This is called chiral limit of QCD, and the chiral limit of QCD enjoys chiral symmetries, and it is exactly the breaking and restoration of chiral symmetry which helps us describing mathematically the phase transition. But there is another important feature of strong interactions, that it is called confinement, and it is related with the fact that we have never seen, we have never seen an isolated quark. We, quarks, we know they exist from evidence, from many experiments, but or many observations, but we have never seen them alone. And why it is so, and is this really forbidden? Well, a very simple way or very natural way um, to address in a pragmatic way this question, if we were able to observe clearly a transition which I can identify as the confinement transition. So uh, this transition at 120 MeV is identified as chiral transition, as a symmetry transition, symmetry, non-symmetry transition, global symmetry breaking of QCD. But confinement, we still don't know exactly, and maybe it's still a symmetry, maybe it's not a symmetry, who knows? And so maybe there is a hidden, hidden the confinement transition that these techniques, these new techniques may help uncover, and that would be really a tremendous success. And to give you a feeling, I know these things are a little bit advertisement, but still is a piece of information. Um, there are 10 problems that are considered the most important open problem of theoretical physics, the most important theoretically theoretical open problem in physics, and indeed the confinement is, is one of them is considered a million dollar problem or something like that because it is really something unsolved and maybe machine learning can help a bit in this direction i don't know that's in hope a hope which I'm so so to speak if you are curious um, to know more about applications of machine learning to lattice quantum field theory or this dia dialogue between quantum field theory and machine learning, that's a very excellent white paper. It has been triggered by the US community, so a DOE sponsored initiative, but we have a strong European participation, so it's really a world effort. And I will just tell you at the end what we are doing also as a strong 2020 in this direction. So the last point I, I like to cover uh, concerns um, gravitational waves and neutron stars. So, so what uh, these artificial intelligence methods can do in these fields. Um, now, we know that gravitational waves have been detected by different observatories and they have uh, different origins. Now, the most popular that those are, are searched uh, more actively, they come from the merger of um, dense, very dense, heavy objects. So they collide and they generate this ripple in the space-time and the gravitational wave starts. And so what can collide to make such a tremendous gravitational wave effect, the gravitational effect, which is uh, a gravitational wave? Well, the most dense uh, objects in the universe can be black holes, in, you know, in order to so gravitation is the force uh, related to mass. So to create waves out of gravitational effects, you need lots of mass. That's why you really need very, very heavy and dense objects. And so that's why one searches gravitational waves in the collision of black holes and neutron stars are mixed. So they have been searched in collision of black holes, black holes, oh, one black hole, sorry, should not be plural, black, one black hole with one black hole, one neutron star with one black hole, or one neutron star and neutron star. 
There is also another source, interesting source of um, gravitational wave, which may also come back from the Big Bang when the space-time was initially formed by this uh, primordial, tremendous primordial soup. And these are also very interesting objects, which are not so directly related with strong 2020, but still are part of discussion. So let me uh, say something first about these gravitational waves. So they say at the very beginning of the universe, the very first gravitational waves. So this is a paper which is already three years old, where uh, in this paper people try to identify a possible gravitational wave, primordial gravitational wave, um, by analyzing the available results from LIGO and Virgo at that time. So that was really presented as um, a flagship project. That's also why I, I want to mention, even if it's not so directly related uh, with, uh, with nuclear physics, because it was really presented as a flagship uh, study of um, artificial intelligence, machine learning applied to, to science. Uh, and in particular, as, as I mentioned before, in the field of big data, because you have this enormous quantity of data uh, that you, you wish to analyze. Uh, so now it's, it's a bit, I mean, it's a, of course, a technical paper, but which is the idea? How do I, how do you study? Where, where are the gravitational waves in this signal that uh, the, the antenna, the gravitational antenna detects? You see, you are, suppose you are an engineer, you are a physicist working at the LIGO laboratory or the Virgo laboratory, and you are sitting in front of your monitor, and at some point you see a sequence of data, and so, oh, oh Oh, must be a gravitational wave. How do I know this? Well, normal way before the artificial intelligence, you have simulations to say, okay, forget experimental data, and I run my simulations. I go to my computer and I run the simulation. I say, oh, imagine this and that happened. So imagine that indeed it was produced a gravitational wave wave in the very first uh, moment of the universe and then you put in your equation of general relativity that you know and you uh, make a prediction on how the signal should look like if indeed uh, this was the origin then you go back to your monitor and say ah this is what i have measured and this is my observation, hmm, do they look similar or not? So, and it is all comparing. And so you, you know how easily artificial intelligence appear here, because really you, you have two patterns and you have to de decide how likely it is that these two patterns are the same. They will not be identical, but they will have to belong to the same category, like the elephants and the penguins, like before, or the phases of as in model connection and clearly this task you accomplish much easier when you have some automatic tool which is capable to put similarities on a quantitative grounds not just they look at them and say oh they look similar but they have a way to classify and categorize the two capabilities of artificial intelligence so this is uh, by doing this they they have been able to identify and to uh, claim that indeed they have detected or identified candidate signals for a gravitational wave from the primordial universe. I don't have the competence indeed to comment on the scientific reliability of this result. I am not aware of anyone challenging this at the time, but I really, to be clear, this is very open science. This is, I mean, it's very frontier science and we must be always prepared to revise what we think so they suggest that this is uh, consistent with primordial uh, ways but now this is a very recent paper by preparing this talk i was just uh, checking for most recent uh, material and uh, this is a very very interesting study in which they re-examine uh, results uh, i hope i'm not running so I hope, I, do I still have two minutes, right? I hope, okay, I, I go for other two minutes and or try to be fast. Um, and which I have, um, they have really, by using deep learning techniques, they try, to, they revise 
some early conclusions by the Virgo analysis and LIGO analysis, and they revise in a direction which is most interesting for our community because they uh, really uh, have a claim of an observation from the merger of neutron stars. And to make a long story short, they play a game, the same game as the other, that you have to make simulations of different events and different scenarios. And so just uh, one back step. So how can you, again, you have these different possibilities, collision, neutron star, neutron star, neutron star, black hole, black hole, black hole. For each of these collisions, you have uh, many different ways to describe the process, which is still compatible with this different scenarios, and then by combining all the possible evolutions with all the possible parameters controlling the process. Why do you have many parameters? For instance, just for describing the neutron star's collisions, you need to know uh, the details of the neutron star compositions. You need to know what is known as the equation of state of the neutron star, the relation between the pressure and the temperature inside the neutron star. And this depends quite a lot on how the neutron star is really done inside the issue with the lava that you condense and you have different forms. Also neutron stars may be condensed in a little bit different way inside. And you have to take into account of all these differences and then you end up with the staggering three million of free parameters in this exercise. And then of course, you no know, human can do it by eye, one by one by one by one, but you feed these uh, enormous sets of possibilities to your machine learning algorithm and they come up with an answer uh, in which form is the answer i'm not sure perhaps you don't see why but they collect all these signals so they are the signals that people see that i told you on their, their monitors and these are labeled with the um, different gravitational waves which have been observed and then after running the algorithms, they assign, I have uh, another slide which is more readable, uh, they assign a probability to the different uh, uh, possibilities that have been contemplated. So I think probably we better understand this here. Uh, for instance, for this event, which has been labeled in this, uh, in this way, so this is the name of the event. So this is the gravitational wave which has been um, detected. And this is, was the original analysis by the LIGO-Virgo uh, collaboration. And so, for instance, for this first gravitational wave, LIGO uh, say this is a binary black hole. So BBH is binary black hole. But after this uh, new uh, analysis, they say, no, this was just noise. This uh, second, uh, well, you say, okay, not very good. But this second was more interesting because this was ambiguous. They say, I don't know, either it's a binary black hole or maybe a neutron star black hole. But now they say, no, we are convinced it's a neutron star black hole. It's very, it's very clear. So this is when uh, this is the histogram of probability. And so the histogram of probabilities peak a neutron star black hole. So it's quite exciting because in this case, it's really clear it was neutron star black hole. And in this case, they even revise the binary black hole. And again, this is, becomes a neutron star event. So it's with this new enhanced analysis, they, I may dismiss a little bit uh, these, uh, previous, many of the previous results, but they have identified with, uh, with a good confidence, according to them, as I said, we wait for the next analysis. This was last month on the archive. And they have presented the revised version, so not yet completely accepted. So we'll see what happens. But if this stays, this is really uh, the collision of a neutron star with a black hole, which will bring information on the composition of the neutron star, one of our goals. So I, I just uh, want to conclude and say there is plenty of scope for further machine learning studies of topics of interest of Strong 2020. And I just want to advertise, if you are interested in learning more, there was a machine learning approach in QCD at the Munich run by Nora Brambilla. We had a dedicated workshop, so you are most welcome to, to have a look at this stuff. And I'll be pleased to take your questions now, but also later if you want to contact me later. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria Paola, for this very nice and brilliant uh, 
lecture that you have done. Um, I don't know if there are some questions. Um, let me see. No. I, I don't see any question. So uh, I, I would I will, uh, pleasure to ask you, uh, in your opinion, what will be the future, um, the future steps in machine learning for uh, uh, the, a better approach to the uh, QCD interpretation? That's 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 really the the question. That's really the question, and it was really very much debated. Uh, for instance, in this recent workshop that was uh, February, March, less than uh, around one month ago, and this was exactly the question: How much we should push machine learning? We know already that machine learning is quite competitive with many methods of analysis. In order to make further progress in many area of application. The, theoretical effort seems also to be very, very large. So I think from theoretical purpose, staying to the specific subject I was mostly discussing of phase, let me distinguish, for the issue of discussing phase transitions, I think what we mostly agreed that we should continue experimentations on, on simple models, especially in the field of neutron stars. Uh, let me say one, one word more. I haven't touched this very important problem, but your question brings me in, in, in that direction. Uh, so you see, when we study this, this phase diagram of, of QCD uh, with nuclei, so this region can be very much investigated with uh, machine learning and ordinary methods, but the region of neutron star is sort of prohibited for uh, normal simulations. And then there is hope that machine learning will help us moving in that direction. So the direction, the most important QCD, 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 um, to uh, uh, answer precisely your question, is really moving in the direction of high density. But this seems very, very difficult. So what we agreed finally, and I think it would be also conclusion of our white book, is recommendation is to focus, maybe pick one relatively simple model and see how all these approaches will compare with each other and decide where we should push. This for QCD. For the analysis instead, for this second part, instead of a neutron star in the context of gravitational waves, I really think that machine learning is absolutely winner method and simply should be pushed forward and continue refining this analysis and interpretation. Because when you handle more models with this level, these parameters, you really, the only, I think artificial intelligence to me is the only way to go. So I really think that should be really pushed forward. So thanks for a very interesting question. Thank you, Maria Paola, for the talk and for this very important uh, answer. Uh, so if there are no questions, I have to see no more questions. I think that uh, the lecture uh, is completed. Uh, so I thank you again, Maria Paola, for your work. Uh, and thank you also, the, uh, Deborah Bivaretti, for uh, elements of uh, National Laboratory of Frascati, uh, who, uh, Allow at uh, this uh, conference on this platform, and all the, the um, all all the people that uh, from uh, their home from their laptop uh, observed uh, this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, the lecture will be available on the website of Strong in the section live events, so you can listen and re-listen and rewatch the conference of Maria Paula. And maybe if you have some <laughs> questions, you can ask. Okay. So see you next lecture. Bye. Thank you very much again.